All right, everybody. I'm Scott Zucker, president of Audubon Everglades. Good evening and welcome to the Audubon Everglades community. Welcome, Audubon. Uh, good evening and welcome, Audubon Everglades community, to our April 2024 annual member meeting and feature presentation. As we gather for our annual meeting tonight, I want to begin by thanking our members and affiliates for helping to make this organization such a resounding success. With 468 friends of Audubon Everglades uh, as members and 1,869 National Audubon Florida affiliates. We are the second largest Audubon chapter in the state. Our monthly meetings attract nationally recognized speakers and average nearly 150 attendees month after month and other organizations, both in our community and beyond from Bush Wildlife Center to Bird Note are increasingly seeking us out to form existing new partnerships and collaborations. As exciting as all this is, it has become increasingly clear to our board that we have soared beyond the capacity of an all volunteer organization. Last fall, the board began to look into the feasibility of hiring our first paid staff committee. After months of careful consideration, we agree that the time had come to launch a search for the executive director to help us better serve our members and realize our organization's potential. Uh, tonight, I am thrilled and honored to announce the results of that search. Our new executive director will be Ms. Sabina Begg. Hey, Sabina, is a Sabina is a seasoned professional with extensive experience in environmental management, communications and leadership. Her experience coupled with her dedication to our mission and her proven track record serving the organization as its vice president make her an excellent fit to help lead us forward. I have had the privilege of working closely with Sabina over the past three years and can attest to her commitment to this organization and the level of excellence she brings to everything, everything she does. As a volunteer board member, Sabina has been instrumental in the ongoing success of many of our programs, including two of our organization's flagships initiative, our robust field trip calendar and our monthly speaker series. In fact, our impressive lineup of speakers is a testament to Sabina's hard work and high regard in which she is held by the wider bird world. Volunteers continue to be the heart of our organization with Sabina as our executive director to support and empower their efforts and guide our organization's continued growth and success. We look forward to many more years of celebrating and protecting birds and their habitats with you. Please join me in welcoming Sabina Begg. Can give her a big round of applause. Thank you. And I, th I think Sabina will be responding in the chat. Uh, so tonight I am thrilled to announce the results of, uh, I'm sorry, I gave that already. Uh, let's go on. At this point, I will begin our annual uh, membership meeting. If you are not a 2023 friend of Audubon, Florida, a member of our local chapter, I'm Audubon Everglades, excuse me, thank you, Mary. Uh, then you may wish to step away and return at approximately 7.20 p.m. when we will proceed with the monthly announcements and have our feature presenter, Dr. Mark Cook. Uh, so with that said, I call the meeting to order. There are two items on the agenda. One is voting to accept the Audubon Everglades 2024-2026 nominating slate for the Board of Directors. And two is voting to accept the Audubon Everglades proposed 20-24-25 budget. We will share the details of both items. I will explain how to vote and then we will vote. So our nomination committee was chaired by Natasha Warwick and she was joined by our science advisory committee chair, Paul Davis and tonight's speaker, Dr. Mark Cook. Natasha is unfortunately currently in the field doing bonneted bat research. She is there mist netting and, 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 and putting tags on bonneted bats. So she has asked me to introduce tonight's uh, nomination slate. Uh, Natasha Warwick is the nominee for the position of vice president. The AE board recently voted uh, to change the bylaws on March 28th to combine the two vice president's positions that we previously had. Natasha has been an invaluable member of our team for two years, demonstrating exceptional leadership and dedication. She has played a pivotal role in projects such as Shorebird Conservation and Adopt an Island Program. Natasha holds, a de holds degrees in Biological Sciences and Environmental Science from Florida Atlantic University, specializing in the conservation of endangered species, particularly sea turtles. Her career began at Jonathan Dickinson State Park, 
followed by a role as assistant regional biologist at FWC. Currently, Natasha serves as wildlife biologist at the South Florida Water Mench District, where she continues to make significant contributions to Everglades restorations projects. Uh, Luann Dillon is the nominee for position of treasurer at Audubon Everglades. Luann brings a wealth of financial experience to our board, stemming from her background in economics and finance. Graduating from Smith's College with a degree in economics, she began her career at Chase Manhattan Bank, eventually attaining the position of corporate vice president over a decade of, de of dedicated service. Following a pause to focus on raising her daughters, uh, Luann transitions to manage back office operations for a transportation brokerage company. Luann's connection to Audubon runs deep, stemming from childhood experiences at a Massachusetts Audubon day camp that ignited her lifelong passion for birding. She has served as our treasurer for the past nine years, bringing a unique blend of financial skill and genuine love for conservation to our organization. Uh, Teresa Bierman is a nominee for the position of Recording Secretary. Teresa is a retired educator with a 39-year career dedicated to shaping young minds, a former language arts teacher at Dreyfus School of the Arts High School, who throughout her tenure was actively involved in leading various clubs and activities, including sponsoring the National English Honor Society and the Asian Cultural Club. A National Board Education Certified Teacher, which is the hot, one of the most prestigious uh, certifications that any teacher in the United States can have, Teresa also served as the girls' soccer coach, instilling values of teamwork and commitment in her players. Even in retirement, Teresa remains deeply committed to promoting education-like initiatives and community engagement. Susan Kennedy is a nominee for the board of directors. Susan is a dedicated lawyer and advocate with over a decade of experience in environmental law, land use law, and public interest advocacy. She co-founded the Loxahatchee River Coalition empowering the public and preserving vast acres of land and restoring fresh water flow to the Loxahatchee River. Susan's past involvement as a member and executive director of the Everglades Coalition has been pivotal in water development plans and campaigns for water resource preservation. Susan's multifaceted interests include ceramics and mixed media artistry, law alongside her continued representation of local organizations in land use and environmental matters. Her involvement with Audubon Everglades Board for the past two years showcases her commitment to conservation and wildlife. Autumn Quixote is a nominee for the Board of Directors. Autumn brings a wealth of expertise in, as an interdisciplinary artist, certified master naturalist, and environmental educator. Previous sta a staff member of New York City Audubon, Autumn has been an invaluable member of our team for the past two years, serving as our environmental educator and embodying the character Professor Screech in our outreach programs. Their unique approach merges art with birding, creating engaging experiences for our community. Kids love her. Uh, they are dedicated to working with a disadvantaged youth and also using their training in birdability to ensure that everyone can enjoy the wonders of birding and nature. And finally, Tiffany Troxler, who is, by the way, the only uh, person, the only nominee who is not a current board member. Uh, Tiffany is a nominee for the Board of Directors. Tiffany is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental and Director of Science in Sea Level Solutions Center in the Institute of Environment at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. She is an ecosystem ecologist and sustainability scientist whose work cuts across science, policy, and management of natural and urban environments. She and her students examine how Everglades ecosystems respond to sea level rise and water management and develop new research and tools to enhance their resilience to climate change. Her research group also advances inter interdisciplinary collaborative research that supports local to regional strategies and actions for climate change mitigation and adaption. She is author of over 75 peer reviewed articles and book chapters. Abroad, she was a program officer with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories based in Japan. She recently, uh, she currently serves as chair of the International Long-Term Ecological Research Network. And you may remember Tiffany from a, a, approximately a year ago when she presented at, at, at one of our monthly meetings. And there is the complete board. So, uh, let's see. 
Do I have the next slide? Okay. Now it's time to vote for the nominated board slate for board of directors. First, there are there any nominations from the floor for AE board of directors? We will vote on, if we have a nomination from the floor, we will vote on any of those nominations separately as that person or persons wasn't vet vetted by our nominating committee and wasn't formally presented uh, during, 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 during this meeting. So if there are, I, so if there are no nominations from the floor, uh, we will we will proceed. So here's how to vote. Um, sorry, I went I went past my where I was supposed to be. Um, it's okay. Here's how to vote. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, only 2023, 20, 24 friends of Audubon Everglades uh, local chapter members specifically are eligible to vote. Please be sure that your registered uh, viewing screen shows your first and last name in the video. So if you don't have that, please change that now. If you're if you are a chapter, a friend of Audubon Everglades member, only one person of a household membership can vote from each registered viewing screen. So please register with individual emails on a separate electronic device if each of you wish to vote. So if, if please, if you are with someone else in the room and you're a household member, you may want to quickly uh, sign on as as a, as as a separate entity. In the poll to vote to accept the proposed 24 to 26 board of directors slate, please vote yes to accept, no to not accept, or just to abstain if you don't if you don't wish 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 to vote. So I'll give I'll give you a moment, and at this point we will go ahead and launch the poll. So Mark uh, Slifkin, if you would do that, please. Mark, are you launching the poll? Oh, I'm sorry. Before we do that, can I just say one more thing? Uh, can I can and, and I'm sorry, I, I did I did forget this. Can someone please make a nomination to accept the uh, nominating committee's uh, 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 nominations for the 2426 board of directors as presented? Can someone? I I, I move to accept the 2426 AE Board of Directors nomination slate as presented. Okay, that was Helen Lawrence. And I saw- I second, I second I, that. Okay, that was Susan Revy. Thank you, Susan. Okay, and now we can proceed. So Mark, can you now launch the poll, please? Did it show up? No, uh, yes, it has. So everyone, could you please vote? Remember, vote yes, no, or to abstain. And we'll give you we'll give you about a minute to vote. In case you need to think about it. Scott, while we're waiting, would do you mind if I try again? Go for it, Mark. <laughs> you're you're the reason most of us are here anyway. Any luck? No. You'll you would see it on your screen if you're sharing. Your screen will yeah, change. Yeah, I know I would. It's okay. not doing it. All right. I'm sorry, Mark. Okay, okay. I'll try again. <laughs> so at this point, uh, we're going to um uh end the poll, I think. We're there. So Mary, if you would if you or Mark, would you would you end the poll, please? Uh hang on a second. I want to do a screenshot. Okay. Right. And remember to download Mark, okay, uh, in the three ellipses. Before you, before you, uh, after you show, after, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and now uh, download in the three ellipses. Okay, so, um, so you can see, uh, Mark is showing the, Mark, you want to show the, res okay, you can see the results. Um, I can marry one yes, one no, three abstain. Okay, so uh, that being said, the uh, the board of uh, the 2024-26 uh, Audubon Everglades uh, Board of Directors nominees are now officially members of Audubon, are officially members of our 
Audubon Everglades Board. Thank you very much for voting, everybody, and we will we will we will we will proceed. So could you end that, please? Uh, end that poll, please. And launch the second poll, please. Oh no, not not yet. I'm sorry. Uh, don't launch it yet. Sorry, yeah, I'm getting. You want the budget first. Yes, of course, of course. So over the years, the Board of Audubon Everglades has always sought to manage the generous donations and dues of our members with the utmost fiscal care. As a result, we have accrued an ample reserve of funds that will allow us to cover what you will see is a deficit in this year's proposed budget. This expenditure is important because it will able, enable us to fund the new executive director position this year. While this expenditure is temporary and will gradually be offset by fundraising, sponsorships, and grants, we feel it is critical and timely to invest in the long-term future of our organization. It represents a strategic decision that will let us continue to fulfill both our fiscal responsibility and our mission as Audubon Everglades continues to grow and grow we have. Here is, a fabulous, here is our fabulous treasurer, Luann Dillon, to formally present the budget for your approval. Luann? Okay, thank you, Scott. Can you hear me okay? Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Um, first, I'll go over the income side, which um, most of our income has come from uh, um, dividends and interest from our investments, as well as donations and memberships. Um, we also had, um, we also have applied for grants. Have received grants in the past, as well as a small, uh, less than three thousand dollar donation. From national it's some income from field trips as you'll see um, the, um spreadsheet um normally the in we um, the income side of field trips just matches uh what we do expect to send for them so um you know we are to cover the expenses um in on um certain um field trips like uh, logic or are one to the dry tortugas. So people will notice that here the income side is uh, greater than the expense side. And that is because um, uh, I've already paid for the drug trip, but um, have not yet received the income from it um, because it's it doesn't, we don't get the income uh, that the field trip occurs. Um, this year we intend to um, have a major fundraiser, a winter gala, which include a silent auction. We'll get money from both um, the tickets and um, the silent auction and chips. Um, in addition, we expect to do several fundraisers that should be fun events, but do have um, an in uh, component to them. Um, some of the deep Loaded our, our virtual 5K, as well as our birds and brews events and uh, a trivia night and a, and a showing of pays. Um, and in addition, we will seek to get sponsorship for some of our, our programs, um, such as we have received um, sponsorships for um, some of the photo club presenters, um, and we will continue that program. On the expense side, um, I've divided the um, the expense into like three categories. Um, the first is administration, which would include um, our our accountant, our insurance, a storage unit, um, licenses, and fees that we pay to the state of Florida, as well as to um, entities like PayPal, um, our office equipment, uh, and then. This is where um, the expense of uh, our new executive director would be uh, would come under. Under programs, we have uh, field trip expenses. Again, it's only for some field trips. Um, our programs for specific our specific um, birding programs, such as burrowing owls, our successful purple martin. Um, uh, Um, programs um, and our plants for birds, which are have been in the past the bush and pine job gardens. We're going to continue with native native garden projects. Um, 
as well as um, different outreach programs for plants for birds. We have we also sponsor the uh, National Audubon's uh, local Christmas bird count. Um, something new for us here will be our shorebird monitoring, which is in conjunction with our Adopt an Island program uh, with ERM. Um, also here, communications, which is our, all our means of communicating with members, including con contact, our web hosting, um, Zoom, um, the, the expenses of hosting our events on Eventbrite, um, that comes under communications. Um, we have here um, a budget for monthly meetings, which, pay, you know, which pays honorariums to some of our monthly speakers. It's our money for photography club speakers, as well as some software that they use. In addition, we give money to, um, to some of our partners, our other environmental nonprofits. Um, when we do um, partnership uh, programs, money in here for an equity, diversity and inclusion initiative which this is money that came from grant that, um, that will fund a project that we have not yet done. Um, <clears throat> we have money in this section of the budget for um, an intern for internships, which we intend to use for um, helping with field trips and also um, with communications. There is money in this budget for um, a volunteer appreciation event and hospitality at some of our other events. Um, there's 5,300 for a software package, which um, you can improve our work as well as integrating our other function into in one place. Um, there are also the expense side of many of our fundraisers, including winter and um, some of our other um, events. Um, on, on the income side and on the expense side, we do have some in-kind expenses. The most part are when um, we do not pay an honorarium to a speaker, but um, their, their, their speaking fees are considered and, um, and you know, an in-kind donation. Uh, educate in the education that would be conferences and memberships um, where um, we pay we will pay for um, our executive director as well as um, forced to go to Audubon Assembly, the Everglades Coalition, and various other conferences. Um, it also includes things like um, our um, dues to Evco as well as the Florida. Ornithological Society. Displays and equipment that are that is for our um, our reusable uh, equipment and um, and used for our outreach programs. So anything that can be used again, like our tent, chairs, etc for the current year, it's planned that we are going to uh, purchase an egg display and a feather display for our outreach program. Um, and then the next category under festivals and family programs, that is that like the, um, like kind of the um, hand up and the activities that, you know, can only be used once that are used for all of these event children. Um, and for the various tabling events that we go to. Um, we also still um, are supporting our, pro our partnership with the Palm Beach County Library, um, where our birding backpacks have been very popular. Um, we also have printing expenses for the various handouts we do for our, our many programs from Purple Martins to festivals. Um, our committee, uh, also, um, well, through our, our science committee, we also donate a scholarship, uh, a sponsor a scholarship at the uh, Gay Academy, which is um, uh, an environmental uh, school here. Also, 
sponsorships and entry fees, which um, we sponsor Everglades Day at Lock um, and various other conferences um, in important at important environmental um, conferences in the county where we would might want to um, uh, be a sponsor and have um, a table so that our programs are represented. Um, so that sums up our, you know, where our money is going. Um, and so you see at the end that for this year, there's a, a, a deficit of just over 67,000, which some of which is, will be um, covered by money that we've received from grants, but we haven't spent yet. And that leaves um, just under um, 60,000 that um, we do um, expect to take from um, our investments for this year. Um, okay, just, I don't know, are there any questions? I'd like to um, propose a motion to accept the budget as presented. Okay, uh, that I think that was that. Uh, um, Shelly. Shelly, thank you, Shelly. Shelly, Shelly Rosenberg making the motion. Uh, can somebody, would someone like to second the motion? A second. And that was, I'm sorry. That was Helen. Helen, okay, hi, Helen Lawrence. Thank you for seconding. And okay, so we're going to uh, put that uh, up there. By the way, uh, Luann is uh, taking time out of her vacation in California uh, to to uh, to present here tonight, present the budget here tonight. That's probably why uh, her her signal was so garbled. It had to come three thousand miles. Oh, sorry, I didn't that's okay. No, that. no, that's okay. We we got we. I think we got the gist of most of it. All right, so let's uh, Mark, if you would, uh, if you don't mind. Oh, let me let me first uh, once again how to vote. Vote yes, no, or or to abstain, please. Only friends of Audubon Everglades, our local chapter members, are eligible to vote. If you are not a local chapter member, a current local chapter member, member, please refrain from voting. And only one person in the household can vote. Thank you. So, Mark, if you could present that, please. It's up. So, everyone, if you could vote yes, no, or abstain. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mark, could you please read the results of the poll? And the results of the poll, 49 votes, 42 yes, four no, three abstain. Okay, and could you uh, 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 download that please and, and then and end the poll, please. Okay, so with that, we've accepted the 24-25 uh, budget. Thank you everybody for your attention and support of the organization. Again, uh, this is a, an organization that is dependent on our member support and we couldn't do any of this without you. And we're so glad that we have you here. And as you know, uh, other than our new executive director, uh, everyone else is a volunteer at this point still. So, so, so thank you and thank you for your support. All right, let's, let's, let's continue. All right, uh, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us on at our 2023-24 uh, field trip it's sessions awesome. as they unfold with an exciting of array of journeys. Does some of this, or Mary does, but their computers are all screwed up. Mm. Okay, Ma Mark, you're you're unmuted. Uh, looking ahead, our 24-25 season is in the works, promising more unique birding opportunities and social events with our expert field guides. Have a destination in mind for our trips or interested in joining our field guide team? Reach out to us at fieldtrips at audubonEverglades.org. Register for the remaining field trips this season by going to our AE calendar, which is on, of course, on our website, or through and, and through the links provided in the chat. Uh, visit our Eventbrite pages for our upcoming trips, such as the anticipated journey to the Dry Tortugas National Park, 
a behind the scenes tour of grassy waters restricted area, which I'll be leading by the way. And if you want to see butterflies as well as birds, be sure to join us at the Huck Shoren Auditorium at FAU Jupiter Campus. And we are also thrilled to announce our newly monthly field trip featuring insect expert and birding field guide, Mikey Green. Join us as he leads explorations of the fascinating relationship between insects and birds across multiple locations in Palm Beach County throughout the year. Stay tuned for upcoming dates, which will be released on our Eventbrite page. If you follow us on Eventbrite, as, about, as approximately 800 people do, you will immediately get the field trips as they are posted. Be sure to follow us on Eventbrite to be the first to know and join us on this enlightening journey into the natural world. We're so glad to have Mikey join us. We are also thrilled to welcome Blake Scarborough as Audubon Everglades' first intern. Blake, a passionate wildlife enthusiast and, enthusiast and conservation and conservationist holds a bachelor's degree in wildlife and conservation biology from Colorado State University, currently serving as a naturalist and volunteer coordinator at Green Cay Natural Center in Wetlands in South Florida. She manages a team of over 65 volunteers and cares for the live animal collection. Blake will bring her expertise to our team. We're so excited. Actively engaging communication, social media outreach, and volunteer coordination to enhance community involvement and awareness. With a deep understanding of local ecosystems, she is dedicated to managing the well being of diverse species and guiding enriching experiences for the community. We are excited to have Blake on board and look forward to the contributions she will make. Uh, joining us and celebrate, join us in celebrating Purple Martin Awareness Month uh, in Palm Beach County, which will be taking place in May. Explore the incredible journey of North America's largest swallow species, the Purple Martin. In, in an encore presentation of the film Purple Haze, uh, where Zach, Captain Zach Steinhauser traces their dependence on man-made nesting structures. From guiding at the largest roost to chasing them across various habitat, Zach's journey unveils the species' unique relationship with humans. Following the film, our Purple Martin Conservation Coordinator, Shelley Rosenberg, will be available for questions. Donations support the Audubon Everglades Purple Martin Program and conservation efforts. Remember, purple martins are dependent on, on artificial housing that we have to supply for them. So that's where your donations go. Thank you, Shelley. Please see the link to register to reserve your ticket. In the upcoming weeks, Audubon Everglades volunteers will be exhibiting and leading some specialized educational talks at these upcoming events. And we are planning a lot of new activities for the upcoming season. I can't wait. Some of those activities seem some particularly uh, 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 the in-person local expert speaking series, youth council, which I think I'm a little too old for, the Umbertus group, perhaps I'm too old for that too. Uh, maybe I'll shave my mustache for that. And of course, trivia, test your bird knowledge. I'm sure there are some of you that are, in are incredible at that. Uh, join the AE volunteer flock and meet our other volunteers at our upcoming volunteer appreciation event. If you're interested, please see the link in the chat and get in touch. And join us for an enlightening presentation on the adverse effects of light at night on wildlife by Travis Longcore, a Jason professor and co-chair of the environmental science and engineering program at UCLA. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I okay, hang on. I have the wrong information. Oh, so join us for our AE Photography Club meeting, a scheduled for April 18th, 2024 at 7 p.m. Uh, Mary will be putting the link uh, to be part of the photography group in the chat. Uh, and we will be sending out a invitation to all Audubon Everglades members so you can join us at that meeting. Uh, uh, Lisa Langle is an excellent presenter and great teacher of photography and her critique should be fascinating. Uh, join us for, I'm sorry, now again, join us for an enlightening presentation on the adverse effects of light as at night uh, on Wildlife by Travis Langcore, a Jason professor and co-chair of the Environmental Science and Engineering Program at UCLA. Travis will delve into the impacts of light on species and ecosystems from disrupting uh, circadian rhythms for birds to uh, fragmenting landscapes for, for, for puma. Discover the various methods to migrate these impacts, including sh shielding, intensity reduction, and adjusting light spectrum. And we can do some of these at home, by the way. Travis, known for his landmark work in ecological light pollution, received the prestigious Galileo Award from the International Dark Sky Association in 2022 
for his contributions to the field. Don't miss this opportunity to learn from a leading expert uh, in the field, which is what we try to do here at Audubon Everglades, bring you leading experts. Okay, Mark, I hope you can share your screen. Uh, well, I've got two options. I've got it on two computers, so I think we'll be able to do one at least. Uh, <laughs> what, a, what a crazy, so let's try. Okay, and and Mark Slifkin, would you be sure to make Mark a co-host? Okay, okay. Now it is our is my pleasure to introduce this month's presenter, uh, who has over twenty eight years of experience studying the ec ec ecology of wild birds. Mark is an individual I know and admire, and I can't wait to hear him speak on this on this fascinating subject. Born and bred in the United Kingdom, Mark has a PhD in avian ecology from Glasgow University, Scotland. His research on birds prior to coming to South Florida took him to the remote Scottish islands. I was going to fake a Scottish action, but I do it terribly. And the coastline of Northern California, where he studied a black guillemots, a sea duck, and Atlantic puffins, a seabird in the auk family, on remote Scottish islands, which I, which I think I just said as well as to uh, uh, La, La Naos in Venezuela, where he studied parakeets. Mark did his postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley, where he studied nesting strategies of a neotropical passerine, the pearly-eyed thrasher, in the rainforest of Puerto Rico. Mark has spent the past 20 years studying wading birds in South Florida, where his research has focused on the restoration and management of birds and aquatic fauna in the Everglades and Florida, and is currently a section leader for the Everglades Systems Assessment Section of South Florida Water Management District, where he oversees the work of numerous other scientists. Mark has authored and co-authored over 50 manuscripts, book chapters, and reports on the ecology of birds, aquatic species, and non-native animal species. Mark edits the widely distributed annual South Florida Wading Bird Report, on which he collaborates closely with other wading bird scientists in South Florida. For his work on behalf of the Everglades, Mark recently reserved the received the 2023 Everglades Champion Award from Audubon, Florida, which I was happily there to see. Mark has a strong connection to Audubon, Florida, leading numerous bird walks and specialty trips, many of which I have attended, where he has shared his knowledge of the Everglades, storm, stormwater treatment areas, the Lila Science Projects being conducted at Loxachee National Wildlife Re uh, 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 Reserve Sanctuary, sorry, and his favorite home turf birding location, Pine Glades Natural Area. Mark also serves on the National Everglades, on the Audubon Everglades Science Advisory Committee, and as many of you know, has been a regular presenter at our monthly meetings. What brings Mark here tonight at his, is his consciousness changing conservation photography, an award-winning and widely published and exhibited photographer who delights in the wonder and beauty of the swamp, some of us do that, you know. Mark has married his unique understanding of animal ecology and behavior to his access to some of the wildest corners of South Florida to capture images that have the power to change how we perceive and ultimately treat our unique natural South Florida environments and the creatures that reside there. And here to present a scientist with a camera, capturing the light for ecological and conservation storytelling, I give you. Dr. Mark Cook. And if you have questions for Mark, remember to put them into the chat and we will do our best to answer all of them. Mark, hopefully you can share your screen now. And Mark, you're currently unmuted. So you need to unmute. Yes. So that, are you getting, are we sharing? Yes, we are sharing. My goodness. Um, just give me two seconds. It was quite the... Uh... All right, does that look good? Can you hear me? Yes, that's brilliant, Mark. We are so glad to hear you. <laughs> in the screen. Oh my goodness. Okay, uh, let me just... Um reorganize myself. Thank you, Scott, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, let me just get myself. There we go. Let me get comfortable again. I have literally tried for the last, was it hour and 10 minutes, hour and 10 minutes to try to get online. So finally, we figured it out. So 
Okay. So um, I'm going to try to, I'm missing half of my screen, but, and I would like to have a pointer if that's a possibility. So just bear with me just one more second. You know what? Let's not worry about that too much. Let's just get on with it. Okay. So apologies, everybody. We had uh, a lot of technical issues. I, I've usually used my um, my PC and we were using a Mac today. So very different. Um, and for some reason, there were all these locks that we had. And now I can't move. Oh, there we go. I'm going to have to press it like that. So, okay. So first of all, I just like to say thank you to a lot of the photos I take are from the air. So I'd really like to thank uh, the helicopter pilots. They are amazing. Um, they seem to be able to read my mind these days about where I want the helicopter. Um, and, um, you know, so there's JK Wells, there's James Davies and Terry Jones are all just these amazing South Florida Water Management District helicopter pilots. And they've you know, they, they're not only great for getting me the, the data and information I need for science, but they've been wonderful uh, helping with the photography too. So first of all, thanks to them. Um, so so yeah, as Scott was mentioning, today's talk's a little different. Usually I give a presentation about the science or an update on how the birds are doing in the Everglades. To some extent, I'm going to, to talk about that as, uh, as well today. Um, and so I'm going to break this presentation up into two parts. The first part is why photography for a scientist, and that's going to cover, you know, why I think photography is so important for a wildlife scientist and a, an ecological restoration scientist. And then the second part is more about the actual photography itself. And I'm going to provide, um, it, it's very general, um, I'm going to provide um, some basically a, a series of tips on how you can create more compelling wildlife images. In fact, any images at all, these refer to any kind of photography that you're doing or would like to do. And, and it's quite general in the sense that folks that just use an iPhone or, you know, uh, or, or are professionals uh, or experienced photographers um, can potentially get some good ideas and some and some benefit from from this part um, because I'm not going to go into technical details about uh, exposure or um, editing or anything like that. This is all about really the artistry of photography and and how to create a more sort of compelling image. Um, you know the visual the visual component of the of the image. So let's start with why, as a scientist, I've really got into photography. And it, and it started about 10 years ago. Uh, we, we needed to buy a camera. My colleague actually needed to, was buying a camera for work. Um, in the Everglades, okay, let me just take a step back. For those who don't know me, um, my main work that I do in the Everglades, it relates to Everglades restoration and particularly the wildlife side of Everglades restoration. And so my one of my main jobs is to try to understand how um, conditions in the Everglades, particularly hydrologic conditions, because that's what's happened to the Everglades. We're trying to fix the water, trying to get the hydrology right again. So we're trying to get the right amount of water in the right place at the right time and the right quality and the right, right quantity. And, and by doing so, we can restore the system, recover its ecology, recover the birds. And the birds are important because they're an important indicator species, particularly wading birds. They... Um, you know, they're very easy to monitor, they're, they're very mobile, they can move very quickly depending on what the conditions are like. So they're really good indicators of what the conditions of the Everglades are like. And so one of my focuses is on trying to understand how wading birds respond to hydrologic conditions. And you know, this photo shows a flock of wading birds in the Everglades. And the way people have been 
quantifying these birds in relation to hydrology is to count them largely from the air. The Everglades is huge, and the only way you can count them, really, is to fly across the system. But flying and counting at the same time, particularly trying to get accurate counts and accurate counts of individual species, is extremely difficult. And we realized quite, you know, quite soon that um, we had detectability issues. We just weren't getting the accuracies that we needed. So the idea was we bought a camera and and we were trying to get much better uh, uh, counts by using photography. And um, and that's how it all started. And actually, my colleague who was initially doing this left. Um, and left it up to me to start doing the photography. And that's how I really got into it. I went out in, my, in the Everglades in the helicopter taking photos and it kind of just progressed from there. And, and you can see how difficult it is with this photo. This is a flock of ibis, a typical flock of ibis that we might see in the Northern Everglades. Um, you know, there's about a thousand birds here. Some of these flocks are up to 3000 strong. And there's a lot of them. We can have up to 10, 12, 15,000 birds in a single area. So um, it's critical that we can actually, we can't count them in the air. It's just too much. Also, when we, when we look at this photo, we see predominantly white birds. But when we look closer, there are other species of all there's these the the little blues the tricolored herons the great blues that aren't quite as detectable as these white ibis and other white birds so we also needed to take photos to try to get you know quantify some of these other species and it's some of these other species like the little blues and tricolored herons that are really suffering and we have much less understanding of how they of how they operate and in the, in, the, in the ecology of the system. So understanding these birds is really important too. And if you think trying to count um, foraging birds is difficult, then um, th this is a, f a, a section of a wide ibis colony with these wide ibis nesting in, in cattails in the central Everglades. It's, it's part of a much larger island. There's cattails on the edge. And they this, this particular year, they were nesting all in the cattail. There's about 500 birds just in here. So how do you count that? And this is only a small fraction. There was actually about 20,000 nests in this particular island. So this is only, you know, there's 40 times more birds than this. So how do we count that? It's, it, it, there's no way you would do it without photography. And in fact, we don't even use just photography uh, for, for colonies this size. We have to use drones where we actually um, stitch, we take lots of photos, they're all geo-referenced, and we stitch them all together to create these huge, massive, um, these images and we have to do that with supercomputers so all the all the imagery is is flattened and, and appropriate and then then those poor folks in the university of florida are actually going out and and counting each individual uh nest from those massive photographs and so it it becomes very difficult um to actually quantify unless we use these photographic methods and you know, a lot of what I do is is related to foraging because that's what it is that's limiting these birds. It's their food and and how water levels affect their food. So I basically go out and take literally tens of thousands of photographs of these foraging flocks. But these flocks are an incredible wealth of data. They don't just provide how many birds are there and what species, but there's so much more to learn. There are almost like a, a, a data repository. So for instance, th this is a photo I took this year. We'd never seen spoonbill numbers like this before. Um, this is only a small fraction of that flock to, so it can zoom in, but the, the, the flock sizes of these spoonbills were just incredible. And so, you know, ju it's just interesting to see in one year how we're seeing so many spoonbills for some reason. But also there's just other things. The way the birds are positioned within these flocks is also really interesting. So what we can see here is while all the, what, all the spoonbills are all clumped together and foraging as one group, the white, the great egrets are all 
along the edges, um, spread apart. They do not like being within beak distance of one another. And they're all on the edges. So, you know, we can, there's a lot we can learn about just the position, how these birds are foraging, how they're positioning themselves, what the dominance hierarchies are. And in fact, my my daughter, my eldest daughter, Sarish, um, she's using some of these photos as part of her high school project to understand how little blue herons are foraging in the Everglades and how the 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 white juvenile birds are um allocating themselves within the flock differently from the adult you know blue versions of the of the little blue heron and so um so there's there's so much we can do with these data with these photographs and so you know originally 10 15, 10 11 years ago when i first started doing all this i really wasn't a very good photographer at all i didn't really know what i was doing but occasionally I would create an image purely by chance that was far more compelling. And, and in, so what I do as a scientist is I provide data to the governing board, to water managers about the state of the system, how well the birds are doing. And, you know, that, and there's big audiences. Some of this work gets shown to the press as well. And what I found and what really struck me, actually, is that if I provided one of these images that, um, you know, I accidentally made a good image of, a compelling Im image that went with the data, my data became a lot more valuable and and it's it's the strength of that data was just more powerful and people were paying far more attention. So, um, for, for, for instance, um, I had VI, you know, we would show photos of the governing board with data on wood stalks. And I'd have Nathaniel Reed, who is a, you know, a, a, a famous uh, politician and conservationist down here in, in South Florida. He would phone me up regularly on a um, every week to check how the how the wood stalks are doing. And 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 if they weren't doing well, he would you know, talk to water managers and use his influence. I'd get people behind me to use their influence on, on how to, you know, and on water management issues. Adding nice photos to the to the wading bird, the annual wading bird that report that I put in, all of a sudden I was getting a lot more attention from the press. Again, putting enabling me to get the, uh, the word out about Everglades restoration and the birds to a much larger audience. So some of these photos were really amplifying the power of, of the data I was providing. And I think that's really because, you know, these photos provide something more tangible than just the data. They provide um, a connection with what we're actually doing out there. Data can be very dry and, and you know, and people really don't make that connection until they see that that sort of tangible connection um, with the with the real world, with the real birds, and so, you know, given all that, I was, I got, you know, quite excited about this photography um, game, and uh, I started taking more and more photos, and I started taking photos of the ecological conditions in the Everglades. And trying to match that with how the the birds or other aspects of the wildlife or ecology were responding to to uh, to these ecological and hydrological conditions. And so, for instance, you know, as this is an image here of Everglades National Park from the helicopter, beginning of the rainy season, very nice wet conditions we were having. This is right. So um, we can see the lakes on the left-hand side, the, the coastal lakes and, and Florida Bay and Flamingo there in the distance. Um, but, you know, what we can see is really nice wet conditions in the Everglades. And this would often lead to really good conditions for the wading birds, particularly for the, for the wood stalks that really needed those wet conditions during, during the wet season to, you know, wet conditions, water in the Everglades is essential for, for growing the fish and, increasing the fish populations for these birds when they nest in the subsequent dry season. And, um, you know, and so I could relate these, these relationships to, to water managers and, and, and sort of physically show what's going on when we have 
the right conditions for these birds. By contrast, on the other hand, um, you know, when we have dry conditions or, you know, there's just simply not enough water in the Everglades, then we have uh, an issue. And um, obviously, there's no water. We've This can be catastrophic to the aquatic ecology of the system. You're killing off, by doing this, it kills off all the fish and um, turtles, crayfish, everything that the birds are eating or, and, and other aquatic organisms as well. And, you know, and I, and I could show this, um, and the, the, the result of that usually is that, you know, these wood stalks would start nesting, um, but invariably fail. And this is basically just, again, nests of these wood stalks, but failing just because we just didn't have enough water during the wet season uh, to provide enough productivity for, for fish and, you know, their basic food source. And, and they, they essentially just run out of food. Even, even if there's still water in the system, they just don't have enough to support the nestlings that, are, that need a huge amount of energy and, and, and fish to be able to grow. And so, you know, it's really useful to be able to put these these connections together. And, um, for, you know, when I just say that or provide data showing woodstalk nesting success, for instance, was only 0.1% this year, no one really bats, a, bats an eyelid. But when I show empty nests full of bones and vultures, you know, people pay a little bit more attention. So... And another responsibility, a very big responsibility I have uh, uh, now uh, as a as a uh, as a supervisor in the Everglades is um, I supervise a group of um, scientists and biologists that are doing really important work in Florida, beautiful Florida Bay. And so, um, and they actually don't work on wildlife. They work on various, various different aspects. Um, sea, sea grasses, the water quality, mangroves, and, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but really important, you know, this is such an important economic and ecological area um, that it's really important for, for me to keep an eye on this area and understand what the ecological conditions are like in this beautiful part of, of, of the Everglades. But, you know, it doesn't always look so pristine. Sometimes we will get these sort of tannic flows of water entering the Everglades and it turns the Everglades to this sort of tea or chai colored um, water here that we're seeing here. The question is, is this a good or a bad thing? We, you know, we, we're not entirely sure. We do know that it is natural to have these tannic flows entering the Everglades. It's fine, um, but we don't know how much. Um, and you know, and so the photo I've taken here. If if you look, um, I, I wish I had that that pointer. Oh, I see if I can. No, I can't. I can't. Let's see if I can get this. Let's see. Yeah, I, for some reason it's not not working. Anyway, um, but if you look at the, the, this is an area called Garfield Bight, this sort of area where we're seeing that orange water and behind it, you can see an area of gray on the land. And basically, and there's also some in this bottom left-hand corner where we have this orange in here. And what you're seeing here is dead mangroves that were killed by Hurricane Irma. And it's possible that that this dead mangrove is actually um, it, it's decaying, and it's possible that that decay and uh, is actually allowing nutrients to flow into the system. Um, and, and usually, what we see in the Everglades in, in these, this Florida Bay area is orange water, and and that's basically just the tannins from the leaves, pretty much like tea leaves, but the the leaves from the mangroves, as water sits on it, it just, the, the tannins leach out, just like making a cup of tea. But with these dead mangroves, you know, huge amounts of dead mangroves, that there's a much greater pulse. And what we've seen is 
um, algal balloons directly downstream of this area. And so our question is, you know, is that a, is that a because of the, these these dead mangroves and and the increase in in detritus and and decay that we're seeing with these dead mangroves. And so these photos can actually sort of help guide hypotheses and 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 show, you know, where we need to be focused in in some of our studies, what areas we need to be sampling, you know, what are the major questions that we need to be asking. Okay, now I've lost my ability to move forward. Everything that could go wrong is going wrong today. Spina, can you figure this out for me? Yeah. Stops, potential chat, summary. Pause, share. I've lost the ability to move. It's annotating right now for some reason. I've got this thing up. Can, oh, I know. See if I, I can't, I can't move anything. That's the problem. I can't see the mouse, so it's. See if you can get, somehow get onto that. Sorry, folks. We'll be right back in a second. We know what we need to do, but we can't see the mouse, and we're trying to. Can you go? Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> um, all right, so okay, so you know, so 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 essentially, we can use these photographs to help us develop scientific projects and and hypotheses and figure out where to do science. Another thing that we've seen in recent years is is um, Restoration projects have come online. We've had some really incredible wet years that have enabled a combination of very wet years and restoration has enabled a lot more water to flow south to, um, to the coastal regions. These coastal regions historically is were extremely biodiverse and abundant. This is where we would see the... Um, hundreds of thousands of nesting wading birds and literally millions of overwintering waterfowl and, and shorebirds. Um, and Florida Bay and the Gulf Coast itself would also have these, you know, beautiful lush seagrass beds supporting, a, you know, a huge abundance of marine fauna as well. And so this really was sort of the powerhouse, the ecological powerhouse of the Everglades. This is where most of the production occurred along these coastal margins. And that's because the fresh water from the Everglades with its, nit with its nitrogen nutrients is mixing with the, with the seawater and its phosphorus, creating a very productive system. And so in recent years, we've seen, you know, incredible flows return to this area. And that's because of the wet conditions we've had, but also because restoration projects have come online and enabled us to be able to send that water to the south. And so, you know, we are in the beginning of restoration and we're beginning to see the benefits of that. And photography is just phenomenal for showing that. This year, for instance, um, um, we had very wet conditions. And this is a, a photo of... Uh, lesser scorp in one of the coastal lakes. It's it's a little difficult to see everything, but in the top left, you can see a kind of greenish color. That's um, submerged aquatic vegetation that's regrowing in this area because this because of all the water is flowing to, into these lakes. These lakes were far too saline and too full of nutrients 
um, to support SAV, the submerged aquatic vegetation. Now with all this fresh water, the, the salinity has declined. We've got this, uh, this vegetation growing again. And within that vegetation, there are lots of invertebrates that these um, ducks and waterfowl like to eat. And so this line here is actually um, thousands of lesser scorp, the largest amount of scorp we've seen since the 1950s. We had almost 50,000 uh, birds of scorp here uh, in the last few weeks, in fact. And so, you know, we are seeing these benefits of, of restoration. Um, you know, there's many others I've shown you in some of these other um, um, presentations that I've given, you know, the huge wading bird colonies and uh, uh, all sorts of other bird, shorebirds, et cetera. But th this is now, this is, you know, within the last few weeks, I just wanted to show you these ducks. Here's a closer view just to, to show you, you know, just um, what these birds are and what kind of what they look like for, for the birders among you. I think, you know, it's mainly lesser scorp. There were probably some some greater scorp in there as well. So uh, just, it, it's so wonderful just to see the abundance, at least some of this abundance return when we have these wetter conditions. But in terms of trying to show restoration success with the, with the water and the, the flows, Really what I'm trying to do is, what I'm really aiming for is to try to show both the flow and the birds at the same time. And so this shows like a, an unusual deltaic pattern of water flows into um, Florida Bay. We rarely see this because we simply don't have enough flow. So, you know, just showing that deltaic pattern and water flowing into the bay, fresh water flowing into the bay. It's orange because of the tannins from the leaves. This is not over, you know, this is not too much nutrients coming in. It's natural tannins from the leaves. And then we have, you know, a beautiful flock of American avocets flying over it. And this, this image actually is in the final got to the final stages of judging of bird photographer of the year. So I'm fingers crossed. I'm waiting to hear whether I get awarded uh, for this image. Photos also are great for showing novel findings and behaviors. Nowadays it's getting more difficult. If you don't have an image, um, you know, if you just have a scientific write-up, it's, it's a lot more powerful if you can have, of images showing these behaviors and new findings. And so this is basically this is basically showing roseate spoonbills and big cypress. Why is that interesting? Well, roseate spoonbills 15 years ago, 99% of them nested in Florida Bay. Now many more of them have started moving from the bay and moving north throughout the Everglades and other areas as well. So this is basically just showing that progression of these birds moving into other areas. There's also Florida Bay, every time I fly, fly over it, it presents something new and interesting to me. These are dolphins doing mud ringing behavior, but it isn't just any mud ringing behavior. This is a type of mud ringing behavior that's never been witnessed, recorded before, but recorded before. Typically, what these dolphins do when they do this mud ringing, and by the way, mud ringing itself is is a fairly rare. It's only it's limited really just to a, to a few places, Florida Bay being one of them. And what usually happens is is a single dolphin swims in a circle, surround it, and surrounds a group of mullet. And the mullet do not like this these sediments that they kick up. And they try to escape this trap. And what they do is that they jump out of the water and over the ring. And what you usually have have is this circle with a with a group of um, dolphins all hanging out on the edge, waiting for these mullet to jump out and into their mouths. What we're seeing here, though, is something completely different. Here we have two, just two dolphins working together in tandem, and what they're doing is they they they're both creating that circle to encircle the fish and instead of completely enclosing it they leave an opening with one turning one way and one turning the other 
And what the fish are doing is they're all streaming through that little doorway that they leave open. And you can just see a little fish, just one of the mullet, just jumping out, trying to, and one of the dolphins just trying to grab it. But this has never been described before. So, you know, how would I describe that? You know, seeing it instantaneously from the helicopter, it would be very difficult. So getting a photograph of that and then writing it up and showing this in a journal is, is how you show this science. Here, again, Florida Bay, just it just keeps producing. The photography is great for showing, you know, these interesting natural phenomena. This is, um, this pink is purple sulfur bacteria. What we have here is a pool of water, maybe a couple of hundred feet across. The little dots in there are actually birds. You can see kind of the scale. There's some dead mangroves in the top right hand corner to give you a sense and, and, and shore, some shorebirds and ducks and, and various other water birds in, in the pool in the middle. But, but these purple sulfur bacteria are just very interesting. They, not just the amazing colors that they produce, but th these are a photosynthetic bacteria, um, but they need anoxic conditions. So they need light, but no oxygen at all. And instead of oxygen, um, they, they process hydrogen sulfide. They need to live, that's their food source, hydrogen sulfide. And they photosynthesize, you know, a, a normal plant would photosynthesize using hydrogen, They, uh, sorry, using water, and they use the hydrogen to create the sugars and and carbon dioxide to, to you know, the, the carbon from carbon dioxide and the hydrogen from water to create the sugars. And the offshoot is, is oxygen. What these guys do is they use um, hydrogen sulfide and methane to so basically what they're doing is they're detoxifying the soil they're using these you know toxins that prevent plant growth and using that to to um to grow and 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 they're converting these nasty um poisons to 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 non-poisonous sulfur and and, and um uh, um and hydrogen um and what you can see here in the middle is, is the birds foraging. And, and so what's happening is, um, and why this kind of toxic sludge might be, <laughs> what we think might be a toxic sludge is so attractive to the birds, is that the anoxic conditions, the lack of oxygen is below the, is, is below the surface, way down in the sediments. And all the critters that need oxygen are having to rise to the surface. And so this is creating this, this beautiful feast for lots of different shorebirds. We can see ducks making trails in the water. There's reddish egrets. There's all sorts of different types of birds in there. Um, but also it creates this, you know, this just beautiful photograph um, of this, you know, almost Mars-like landscape. But you know, ultimately, you know, why am I doing all this photography now is what's closest to my heart is, you know, trying to show to the world the, the crisis we're in. Um, we have, in my lifetime alone, we have lost um, somewhere in the region of 3 billion birds. That's a quarter of all the birds of the United States. Um, and prior to that, we lost many more, you know, many more before that as well. So, you know, at the beginning of my lifetime, we had a depauperate stock of birds. And, and in the last 50 odd years, we've seen this huge decline and it's continuing to decline. The same with mammals. Only 4% of all mammals on Earth now are wild mammals. The rest are either mainly cattle or humans. 64% of all mammals are livestock. We are decimating the planet and biodiversity. And it is crucial that we get the message out. Um, uh, and, you know, and it's not, this This is our own existence that we're dealing with here. This is an existential crisis. 
we need functioning ecosystems. We are not separate from from the environment we live in. We may feel like we are, but we're not. All our food, our water supply, uh, the clean water, all relies on functioning ecosystems of which birds, mammals, plants, everything is a part of. The more we destroy it, the more blocks from the Jenga tower we remove, the more likely we are to see that collapse. And so it's really important for me to get that message out. It's important for me to, to instill a, a, a love of the environment for my children and for uh, and for other young folks and, you know, for everyone, really, to the extent possible. And the way I do that, I do my own little part, you know, I, I do the, my science and with the photography, you know, I'm trying to build it up, you know, I'm getting into magazines, f I use photography for um, scientific journals, uh, books, uh, various different types of magazines. So, you know, that that's how I'm using this this photography these days. And probably the, the, the most success I have had so far with my photography in getting the message out, it's actually been through conservation, conservation based uh, photography competitions. Um, and particularly one called the Mangrove Photography Awards. It's, it's becoming quite a big photography competition now. It's very uh, focused on wildlife and man in, within, not just wildlife, but mangrove ecosystems, people in mangroves, wildlife in mangroves, um, various different categories. Um, but this is an image I took uh, in the mangrove region just in, off in just off Southwest Everglades National Park, a, a, an aptly named area called Shark Point. And it's an area where um, nurse sharks mate. And it, it's pretty amazing um, to, to watch these. The, the male, so um, <laughs> mating for sharks is not easy, right? They, they, they don't spawn, they actually impregnate like, you know, like mammals do. They're not, they don't spawn like fish. Um, but they're in water and they've got no arms and legs. So they're bobbing around in the, imagine bobbing around in the water trying to procreate and you've got no arms and legs. So what the male does is it kind of grabs the pectoral fin of the female, drags her into the shallows so it can get purchase. And, and, and that's what you're, without going into too much more details, that's what you're seeing here. And, um, and, and this one, um, uh, second place award uh, in the mangrove photography awards for last year and um and why i that's exciting to me is it's not just about getting my work awarded it's the fact that it it it's a special competition that a lot of people pay attention to it got published in the guardian the bbc and a whole host of other big national international organizations and uh, the icing on the cake was that these photographs were actually shown um, at um, the big IUCN COP, the um, United Nations um, Climate Change um, Conference that was attended by 70,000 people, um, including, you know, major politicians and leaders from, from countries around the world. So, so that was really exciting. Okay, so that's the first part. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna try to hurry up a little bit more. I'm gonna the second part is really how do you create a co compelling images? And basically here I'm gonna give an, a number of tips on how I how I create images and and hopefully I think that some of these tips should should be should be useful to you. Like I said, even if you use a Depend, regardless of what kind of photography you do, what level you're at and what kind of cameras you use. So the first thing I do when I'm taking a pho photograph is I, is I kind of instantaneously ask myself these four questions. What am I, you know, let's take a step back. The world 
that we're trying to take a photograph in is, is extremely complex, right? We have this big world that we're looking at. It's three-dimensional. And we are trying to take one part of that and take that three-dimensional reality and, and put it on a 2D, two-dimensional canvas. So to do that, we need to sort of figure out how to do that in, a, in the most appropriate way. And so what I do is, first of all, I ask myself, what am I actually seeing? What is it that's grabbed my attention that, that I want to take a photograph of? And it, in that respect, what I'm doing is I'm asking myself what's really interesting about it. How, how can I describe that scene? Is it, a, is it a bison on the plains or two bison that are fighting, you know, two males fighting over females? So, you know, I try to sort of look at the adject, you know, think about the adjectives that might describe that scene and figure out what the story is I want to tell. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I want to tell about that scene. And while I'm, you know, and, and key to that is to tell that story to ensure I'm getting, you know, the aggression, you know, all these adjectives, the aggression, um, the the tension, the the um, the weather conditions, whatever it is, what what is it I really want to describe in that image? And so, so what you need to do then is you have to think about well, what do I need in that image? And just as importantly, what do I want to remove from that image? Are there other bison in the background? Is there a tree right there that's kind of that just doesn't fit in the scene? Is the sky a horrible, you know, is it too bright that we really don't want the sky? So the key is to try to, to remove and include only those things that you really want to, to for, your, for your message. It's like writing, really. You're trying to just get it down to the most simplest message possible. And so, you know, here's an image that's just a quick example of this. I actually took this pretty early in my photographic um, journey. Um, I'd seen this young alligator in this pond uh, in Pine Glades. It, it's surround, this pond is uh, in the middle of a cypress dome. And, you know, I one of the things that I'm always trying to do, and I think Scott even mentioned that in the introduction, is I'm trying to show the beauty of the swamp. You know, a lot of people really are scared of swamps and wetlands. And and I, and you'll see this in some of my other photos, I'm trying to show that they really are beautiful and worth saving. But also sort of fascinating and intriguing at the same time. So here, you know, I knew there was an alligator and I knew at certain times of the year and at certain times of day, um, during the winter, when when you still have the dead leaves on the cypress trees that are kind of that orange color, that on a sunny day at sunset or near to sunset, you get this beautiful glowing water where the reflections from the sky and and from from the from the the leaves on the trees will create this beautiful image, and and so I wanted to create the colors, and that these are some beautiful um, complementary colors. Blue and orange goes really well together. But also, I wanted to sort of show the 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 reptilian side, that sort of uh, something that evokes the the primitive nature of these swamps, shows that sort of glassy reptilian eye. So the so. There's beauty and there's wilderness involved in this image too. But to do that, you know, I had to try to remove any um, sort of distraction, distracting components. There were rocks, there were branches, there's clumps of weeds. So I was constantly moving around to try to get an image that just showed the story that I wanted to tell. And hopefully you'll see that in some of my Im other images as we, as we move forward. But, and so to be able to isolate your subject and and to, to isolate that story to the extent possible, there's a number of tricks that we can use based essentially on how humans visualize the world, basically what their brain, how their eyes and brains are working together. 
And so there are a number of things that we're attracted to when we look at a scene that we may not realize. And so we're attracted to, to bright spots. We're attracted to contrast and sharpness. We, where our eyes will always go to, to color, bright, especially bright colors. And, and we always notice differences in size, shape, and orientation. And so let me give you some examples of that. So I think the first thing that you probably noticed on this photo is the first thing, well, at least for me, the first thing I do, I, I can't, I can almost not stop myself doing it, is I'm looking straight at the face because that is the brightest part of this black skimmer and the brightest part of that image. We're attracted to eyes as well. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but the eye really isn't that strong in this image. It's kind of black within a within the black feathers. So our eyes are always going to these bright areas. And so using bright areas like this helps us define the image and draws our attention um, to the subject that we want it to. The same is true of this snow egret, this white snow egret. And this is enhanced because of the contrast. We've got a dark background, but and, and because of that, our eyes are going, you know, almost immediately to those luminescent black uh, back lit wings of this snow egret, this beautiful dancing snow egret. But of course, not everything is a white, has a white face or is a white bird or a white animal. And, and, but that doesn't matter. You can, there are, there are other mechanisms that you can use to gain, gain, gain attraction, uh, uh, gain focus on, on your subject. Um, and so you can even use sort of subtle contrast. So, you know, these turtles are quite dark colored, but the light is falling on them and not on the foreground and background. So, you know, that enables these, these turtles, these uh, Florida red belly cooters to sort of pop within the scene. Now, one thing I should note, and I'll show you an example of this later on, is notice that there is no, there are very few sort of bright spots grabbing our attention in the background or foreground. Um, apart from the, the the reflection of the turtles, what I try to do as much as possible is I take a take. If you're in the woods or in an area like this with with leaves that can really or branches that can really reflect the background and distract you, you either take photos during a dull day so there isn't so much contrast compared to when it's sunny, or you can use a a, a polarizing filter that kind of just remove some of those bright areas in the background. This is a, an image from, from the aircraft of, of, from the helicopter of, of obviously roseate spoonbills flying over Florida Bay. The bright, we're instantly attracted to the bright colors of, of these spoonbills compared to the darker colors of the background. And there's a couple of other things to note in this photo too. The first is that um, warm colors such as pinks and reds and yellows and oranges um, pop out towards us, whereas cool colors such as greens and blues retract into the scene. So having a warm color on a, you know, like pink on a blue background also accentuates it pops that the subject out further and another thing to note here is the complementary colors the blues and oranges the tannic waters and the the blue green algae in the background um really enhance the scene just because they're they're they gives a calming feel to the scene because they're complementary colors Again, this is this, another example of that. We have these uh, these beautiful pink flamingos in, in STA2 uh, foraging really close to me. This is when um, uh, Stephen and I were trying to sample for food to try to figure out what these uh, flamingos are eating in STA2. And um, surprisingly enough, they flew in and landed within about 40 feet of us, enable, enabling me to get some really nice close-up images of these birds. But again, the, the warm pink hues pop out towards us compared to the 
the, the retracting blues of the cooler water. Color can also be a contrast too. So we have quite a contrasting scene here. We've got these burrowing owls in Homestead in this kind of really sort of industrial urban setting. And it's a contrasty, almost monotone black and white kind of image, but the color of the eyes, even though it's less than 1% of the entire image is what grabs our attention. Again, the eyes, we human beings are programmed to, to follow eyes and to locate eyes. But it really, but here the yellow, it, even if they weren't eyes, that yellow would still really grab our attention because it's a contrasting color against a monotone background. Now this sandhill crane in Pine Glades, this is a motion blur image. Motion blur is when you have a really, you have terrible lights, really dark conditions, and you're you're restricted to you know very sh um, slow shutter speeds. And so one thing you can do in that situation is have these motion blur images where you pan follow the the bird in very you know and with very slow shutter speeds everything is blurred but if you do it just right you can still get the head that is more stable than the rest of the bird the wings that are moving and you can get that sharp and what that does is it enables you to that sharpness is again it's a contrast actually sharpness in an image is is actually contrast but at a very micro scale each individual pixel has a lot is is contrasted against another pixel and so really is another form of of contrast but but we think of it as sharpness again sharpness here we're drawn first of all to the to the to the warm pink flower but we soon realize that that wing that that flower is kind of is out of focus um and so what that does is it draws our eye and we've got this movement, a diagonal line almost to the, the heads towards um, the right hand corner of the image. Diagonal lines provide a sense of movement and direction um, in an image. And that's kind of leading us to this little um, this little uh, walking stick here that is in sharp focus. So, you know, that's what you know, we start off in one part, but we're moving uh, we we want the eye to move towards the towards the little stick insect. Orientation. I talked about how you know how different orientation can be can can grab our attention. And so this is an image. Um, it got commended in um, uh, Bird Photographer of the Year uh, a couple of years ago, and I call it the nonconformist. Because what we have here is a whole bunch of avocets taken from the helicopter. And what the avocets are doing is, you know, they all face the same direction because they're facing either into the wind or whatever the sun direction is. They, they you know, they have a, pre it's more comfortable for them all to face in one direction. But of course, this little guy in the middle is what stands out. One, because it's in the middle and that's where our eyes automatically go. But also because it's, orientated in in a completely different direction and so you know and this can this can uh, um can refer to um colors or size as well if we had five big lions and then there was just a tiny lion your focus would go to the odd one out and same with you know different colors etc so now i just want to move on to eyes and perspective eyes are um, eyes and perspective, they're kind of related, but you'll see, you'll see why I've put these two together. So I mentioned before, as humans, you know, particularly as humans, we, 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 we've evolved very much to um, look at eyes. This is part of our social nature. We're very social. We can, um, it helps that we can gain very, very subtle clues from from facial features particularly around the eyes with you know judging other people which was obviously very important for you know uh, the social aspect of the lives that we lead 
Um, but also, you know, very important to understand, you know, if a saber toothed tiger, tiger back in the day uh, was looking at us. And and so we're, we're very attuned to be able to sort of pick up on eyes. So eyes are key. We if the eyes aren't in focus, 99% of the time, you may as well just trash your image. It's key to have the eyes in focus. And, and so, and, you know, and like I said, they, this image is kind of blurred really apart from this tiny little face and these big yellow eyes. And that's what really draws us in to, 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 to the owl here. And so having these really focused, uh, well-focused eyes and also the catch light, the little, the little white dot that we have that enables that gives life to the eyes as well. So it's really important to try to get some sort of catch light within the eye as well. Um, and, and this just this image basically just accentuates how how important the eyes are. Pretty much all of this image is out of focus apart from a horizontal band that runs across the eyes. But the image still works really well because the eyes are in focus. They're that important. So now onto perspective, and I can and I'm going to use this image as an example. So there, you know, there's perspective in the terms of whether we want to be, you know, are we going to take an image from standing up high as humans? We're often looking down onto things, you know, animals that are smaller than us. And that's what I'm doing here with I'm. I wasn't able to get into the water in this situation with an alligator, so I wasn't able to get uh, eye level. So I'm taking a photo from above. And by taking a photo from above, that kind of, it gives us a detached view, like almost like a godlike, detached, um, impersonal view of, of your subject. And, and that can work well in some instances, um, uh, but for, for wildlife, it doesn't often work very well, although I will talk about that in a little bit with regard to my aerial images. But, he, but there are ways around that. So one way to get around having to take a photo from above is to have a really close-up image. Close-up makes it a lot more intimate. It's, you know, you... you and almost claustrophobic to some extent, but it, it provides that intimacy that is lacking from generally when you're taking an image from above. I, I don't know about you guys, but I feel that this is quite an intimate image and, and I'm right there with that gator. I, that guy is looking at me, he is, he, he is there. If I'd taken it at eye level, it it wouldn't may not have even been as effective. I wouldn't have been able to get all that interesting jawline and everything else. And so, so that leads me to a point. When you're taking an image, look, think about all the different angles and perspectives that you can use. Don't just think of it in, you know, you can move around, take a high image, take a mid image, go below if you can, move around. It's all, that that's what I always do. I try to take as many different perspectives as possible when I take an image. Um, and sometimes it will surprise you what works best. So here we have, here we're looking head on at eye level to these young burrowing owl chicks. Um, they're excited. They're, there's a parent coming back to the nest with food. So, you know, and, and with this, eye level you it's very intimate you feel this is what the mother chick is looking at as she's moving towards these these nestlings this it it, it brings you into the scene it brings you into the life of the animal a lot more than than typically a a, 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 a shot from above um now this bad boy my goodness this this was a fun photo shoot um, I was working for Jupiter Magazine, taking images of um, this uh, um, cougar from California. It had been um, it burnt its paws in one of the forest fires. But boy, is was this guy a force to be reckoned with? 
Um, and I think that shows in this image. Um, and so I was, you know, he was in his cage, but he was in the back of the cage and I was, you know, I was loud behind the scenes, but I was still behind a, behind a cage. And I, I guess I was about uh, eight, 10 feet away from him. And what I'm doing here though, is I'm shooting from below. I'm not shooting at eye level. And shooting from below gives your subject dominance. If you want a powerful animal or a dangerous animal to appeal, to appear even more dominating, shoot from below. Um, and, and here, oh my goodness, this, this just brings back memories of shooting it because this enigmatic look this guy is giving me, he was calm. You know, he, he couldn't move a lot because his paws were still really quite sore. But man, he he gave me some attitude just by just by staring at me. And getting at ground level or getting very low can also have a number of different advantages as well. If you get low, it actually compresses the scene and blurs the foreground and background a lot more than if you were taking from a higher elevation. Now, this is actually a marsh rabbit that I took in my backyard. And, you know, I didn't want to show all the grass and the, you know, weeds and everything else. I wanted to try to remove that. And the best way to do that is if you get low, you're obviously really close to that foreground. And so it really blurs it out. And so there's enough here to show that it's kind of feeding in a meadow, but it's not that ugly, dis you know, distracting grass that you might get otherwise. So get 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 low if, if you can, and that can really help um, compress that background and foreground and, and remove some of those distracting elements. And it also makes, I don't have the most expensive lenses. You know, uh, these photographers, they'd be using now $13,000 F4, you know, 400 or 600 millimeter lens. I can't, I can't afford that. By doing this, it kind of replicates a much more expensive lens, gives you very nice bokeh and, and, and blurring that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get unless you were so close to that foreground. And so that leads me now on to um, the importance of foreground and background. I will not generally, unless it's, you know, a harpy eagle in Panama or something, I will not take a photo unless I have a good foreground and background, because that is just as important as your subject. And that foreground and background needs to complement your subject. Um, and there are many ways of doing that. If I had taken this in full focus, that background would have become too, too distracting. So what I'm doing here is reducing to a certain level the, the depth of field. I want some of that foreground in. This is a, by the way, this is a pine woods, uh, pine woods uh, tree frog. Um, it's climbing over um, what, St. John's Wurt. Uh, and, you know, it's natural habit. It's a natural habitat that it's in, um, and so I just want you know it. The I wanted to show the frog within its natural habitat, and so but without that habitat becoming too, too distracting. So there's enough detail, but there's not too much detail that it's too distracting from the frog. Now here I've blurred the foreground and background even further. And that's really useful for creating depth. Again, what there's a lot of distracting elements. I've got a beautiful pink color for the, um, this is blad a pink bladderwort, the flowers in the wetlands. Again, I'm trying to show how beautiful these wetlands and swamps can be, the colors you can get. There's beautiful colors. But if I had it in focus, it was actually quite messy. There's lots of stalks and bits in there that just would be distracting from the main subject, which is the bird foraging in this beautiful wetland. And, and also this image, the blues and purples match the bird, um, which adds an, another element to the image. And also the pinks and the yellows 
are complementary colors as well. So providing a level of calmness and tranquility to the scene. Sometimes you want a bit more information in the background. This is another photo of a burrowing owl at a Homestead Airport, again, in this sort of industrial urbanized setting. And I wanted to show that industrial urbanized shedding, setting and, you know, showing a fuel truck in the background. Again, it's blurred. You, I, you do not need it to be in full focus. There's enough there to show what, um, what the tr what's in the background without it sort of overpowering your your main subject which is this burrowing owl this feisty little guy in surviving and doing well in this urbanized setting notice also that i'm shooting from below giving trying to give some some dominance to this bird showing how feisty and strong it is in in this urban setting um now here, I don't really have complementary colors. The reds and yellows and browns do not work that well, but you don't want, you don't always want complementary colors. Sometimes you want to feel a little bit angst. This is a, this urbanized urban setting that makes you want to feel a little unsettled. So that's why, you know, using these colors, this, these bright reds and yellows and browns that don't match, that sort of really makes it feel a little uneasy. Um, and that was an intentional, was intentional. Here we have uh, American white pelican, these incredible, huge, um, huge nine foot wingspan, fighter bomber, jumbo jet like birds that just looking at that, it doesn't really look like it should be flying. But what, what we're doing here is providing a foreground element, some some pink bird that sometimes shows up in Florida. That pink bird, that flamingo, which in itself is interesting, but it provides it provides depth. It provides a sense of depth by blurring that foreground element. Emphasizes a three D. It gives a three D emphasis to a two D two dimensional image and helps create that depth effect. And um, and we can use you know, these foreground elements like, you know, other birds in, that are, you know, blurred out like this to actually frame as well. It not only provides that depth I was talking about, but we can use it to frame, frame the real central limit, the central subject of what we're, of, you know, our main focus in the image. So here note that I have these blurred images of these wide ibis in the front, but you don't want to blur them too much and you don't want them sort of meshed up too much so they're not recognizable shapes. You can still tell that these birds are wide ibis here. In this image, I would have preferred if that middle uh, wide ibis was a little bit more to the center to provide a little bit more balance, but you can only do what you can, you know, you can't do everything with it. <laughs> with these birds. And, and that brings me, well, I'll, I'll bring that up in a minute. You can use, I, I talk about framing. This is another way of, of framing your image. When you frame an image, you can, you bring attention to your, to your subject. So here I have a frame in the foreground, the green leaves, and I've also framed its head within this, within the sky of the background. Now, um, I, I, I talked earlier about uh, the fact that these white bright areas is what we're attracted to. Um, and that can be problematic. If we're taking a picture of a bird, these bright spots can be too distracting. And that bright spot in the top left is a little bit distracting, but the main, but having that bright area behind the black head of the bird is actually providing contrast and drawing our attention. So there are ways that you can use, um, you know, what might otherwise be a, a, a problem in an image to your advantage. Um, but the key here I want to show is that it's really nice to use um, these foreground elements to frame your subject. It brings you in um, into your subject. Um, again, I talked about this earlier. 
um, to be able to bring things forward and provide a little bit of uh, depth is is using colors. Um, we've got this warm, very warm colored red um, from the uh, summer tanager and the green background of the Panamanian rainforest behind it. It pops that bird to our, you know, bringing it forward and providing a sense of depth. And we can do that also with, with bright versus dark backgrounds also give a sense of depth. I'm gonna to try to speed up just a little bit. Wildlife photography is undoubtedly one of the most difficult forms of wildlife photography or difficult forms of art in, in that respect. If you're a painter or, or even a studio photographer, you can arrange the elements of your image as you so please. But wildlife do not give a crap about your artistic um, intentions. They will, in fact, they do everything they can to get away from you. So this is a very difficult component, but what I wanna talk about now is, is artistic com composition, how to try at least to arrange your, your subject within the frame so it gives it balance and flow. Now, most young, most um, beginner photographer, myself included, would take photographs and they would center their subject. Um, and if you do that, our our eyes will automatically, you know, in any sub, they try, they always want to go to the center of an image. But the problem with our, you know, if you placed it in the center and our eyes always going to the center, is that it means our eyes don't really move around the frame very much. They just quickly see it and then they move on. It, 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 it doesn't hold the attention like it does if you have an image with your subject placed somewhere else with, you know, within, within the frame. And so there are a number of rules, so-called rules um, or guidelines that you can use to, to, to try to place your, your subject for, for a, a more balanced and um, more visually pleasing image. And one that you've probably all heard of is the rule of thirds. If we, if we section out the, the image into three um, equal lines, sorry, two equal lines that separate three equal um, components of the, of the image, both vertically and horizontally, then it's then these these intersections of the lines and along the lines are, are kind of the power areas where we want to kind of put our um, our subject. And so what I tend to do is I try to put either the the face or the head or the legs along the lines of these images, um, and that quite often will work and will make a, a more pleasing image, but you know, rules are meant to be broken and it doesn't always work. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. And so, and here I have a, a willet on the beach, Jupiter beach. I've placed the legs on the vertical line here. It's rule of thirds. Um, and, and this was a photo I took a long time ago as well when I was first, you know, learning the craft, but it doesn't feel particularly balanced. The, the right hand side feels a little bit sort of too empty for my liking. And so I, I try to counter that. If you if you look at the, um, if you go from the top left-hand corner of the image and do a diagonal line down to the bottom right-hand side, I've cropped it to, a, to an extent such that the bird will follow from its tail to its eye along that line. And that, tr that gives it also, you know, you're dissecting it, the image in half um, of, um, across that plane uh, in that respect. And that also gives a little bit more um, uh, balance, um, but it still doesn't kind of work. There's still that empty space that just isn't working. Here we kind of have the same kind of scene. This is a, um, a uh, ground squirrel what, uh, in um, uh, Colorado, in just outside Denver. And but this is more balanced. It's the same kind of setup. We've got the, the the animal here on that intersection point. But what we have here, if we look, the the lower third is is a light shadow. The the top third is a dark shadow. While the center is is um, is the the bright sunlit, you know, with the setting sun. 
uh, golden um, light on. So, you know, we've balanced it from, from top to bottom in that respect. And, you know, although there's nothing on the left-hand side in terms of another animal, there is actually a kind of a shadow there. We've got this bright, um, uh, you know, rodent here and a dark, darker shadow here. And that, that kind of balances it. We've got some orange in the top right and some orange in the in the top left. What's that? And and that and that kind of balances the scene. All right. There are other ways to do this is the golden ratio or the Fibonacci spiral. This is actually quite difficult to achieve with wildlife, but it works really well when when it works. Um, a lot of nature is based on this ratio of uh, 1.62 to 1. Um, obviously, seashells, sorry, the, the, you can't see this very well, but you can see this spiral here. This is the Fibon Fibonacci spiral. I'm sorry, I couldn't find a white version to put over the image. But but that's kind of your follow, you know, the line of the, the trail is following that and it's ending up um, with the with the top right flamingo here. Um, at the center point. And so that, you know, can work really well. And that's because this is so, this um, ratio is so common in nature. And the same with these, these dolphins as well, following, following and um, flowing from this dolphin through the mangrove and, and round. Uh, we, we break the rules. This is a, this is a Everglades crayfish center positioned, um, and the reason I place this centrally is because it's symmetrical. This would not work if you put that on the, the rule of thirds. It, it's best anything symmetrical place in the center. Sometimes we want to show a bit more of the environment that the animal lives in. And so we there's a danger of it getting lost. Um, so it's useful sometimes to have leading lines that sort of point to our subject. These don't have to be physical lines here. We just have the glowing um, spots of sunlight hitting off the rack here that are that are creating these lines um, towards this um, to this uh, to this plover. Um, or and even if we have a close up image, you know, leading lines can can help guide to our, to to and just create a more pleasing movement through the frame. So here, the the feathers are actually the curving feathers are actually pointing to the main part of the subject, which is its face and eye. Another image just showing leading lines of these water droplets leading to this tricolored heron. Um, shapes can also be important. Here we have a three-toed sloth in the uh, cloud forest of Panama. It, it, uh, you know, when you're shooting a mist, things can get a little lost and a little blurry, but the powerful images of these triangles and diagonal lines emphasizes the animal. And we've got a nice, really um, right angle of its of its arms there, creating this, um, you know, very sort of strong, powerful um, shapes um, that that are, are attractive to the eye. Here again. Um, a triangle. These are these scorp that I was taking photos of the other day. If this was just a an amorphous blob of of these birds, um, then it wouldn't be as effective. But here we have this strong, powerful triangle. Somewhat unusual, right, to see a triangle like this as well. You know, these relatively straight lines in nature like this. Patterns and balance. Humans love patterns, so we're really attracted to them. Here we have kind of a center point um, American pelican, and it's kind of got concentric rings that are, are, are attractive. But also what's to note here is that it's balance. We have white pelicans and the white and dark areas are relatively well balanced. Texture can also be important and, and very pleasing to the eye, particularly when it's contrasted with something, you know, non-textural. So here we have very textured grass and relatively smooth white ibis flying over um, flying over the northern Everglades. Now some, some aerial images. Here again we have these, if you remember I said if you have these, um, if you're shooting from above and particularly when you're shooting from way above like in a helicopter, 
you have this kind of like God looking down, very detracted um, view. You're, you're, it's not very personal at all. And it, it took me a while to figure out how to take good artistic images from the helicopter. And a lot of it has to do with patterns, shapes, and movement of animals, you know, tra you know, trails of these shorebirds moving through the system. And, and you'll see a lot of my images here have diagonal lines. Again, these powerful diagonal lines that, again, they produce a kind of movement through the scene and, and are very powerful for doing that. And, and here we actually have multiple diagonal lines and triangles that help um, make this image more attractive. Here we have an alligator down here in the bottom left-hand corner in a, in a dried out area. Um, but here it's the, again, we have some diagonals, but it's also sort of branching, um, sort of deltaic again, looking kind of habitat. Patterns and colors. This is just a turkey vulture flying over Florida Bay, but it's the diagonal lines again and, 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 and lines and different shapes and colors that are, you know, we've got, and it's almost moving through the center. So it's well balanced on one half. We've got these interesting sort of orange patterns. And on the other half, it's more stripes. But at the, but the, but grabbing your attention is this um, very contrasted bird down in the, in the bottom there. And notice it doesn't have to be rule of thirds. This works without it being on a intersecting line. Again, shapes, patterns, colors. This is um, uh, blue winged teal swimming over these um, tannin colored waters. And again, we've got some nice blue and orange con uh, com complementary colors, uh, the blue of the, uh, the blue green algae. Patterns that are created by, by these animals, the blue winged teal foraging in very shallow conditions in Florida Bay. White pelicans on the mud flats of snake bite in, in Florida Bay. Again, blues and oranges and diagonals and textures uh, and contrasting birds too. Light is everything. Um, light it adds that touch of magic. If you get the right light, it can add that touch of magic that's needed to transform even a dull scene into something very special. Get out early, get up before dawn and get to your subject before dawn so you can catch this golden, beautiful golden light. Um, this is swallowtail kite roost in, um, in, in um, Sand Hill Crane Park of PGA. Um, you know, and it, the the beautiful light just accentuates all the color. If I took that image two hour, an hour even later, it would not, it would look nothing like this. What I tend to do when I get first get up and the sun rises, I try to get some backlight images, um, get some beautiful silhouettes again, just a simple picture of a crane, but it's the light and that backlit silhouette that makes this image. As the sun rises a little later, maybe 20 minutes after sunrise, you can still get some beautiful backlit images, particularly if you take it in wet vegetation that can create these sparkly conditions and, and beautiful bokeh. Um, over the shoulder light, that's what we're all taught to, to photo, right? Have that sun over your shoulder. It can be beautiful. This, go, this um, bald eagle nests in Northern Everglades, um, but it, you have to be careful of these um, of these image of these over the shoulder because it can be a little flat. You don't have you know the shadows are directly behind the the subject, so it can be a little flat. Um, but you know, but sometimes that's that works very well. Quite often, what I'll do is I'll move just a little bit off angle to get a little bit more texture in the feathers you get a little bit more shadow it provides a little bit more texture so instead of just having it coming directly over your shoulder move a couple of steps to the left or right to try to get a little bit more texture the blue hour some of the best light is actually bef you know before the sun rises or after the sun sets um and uh here we have flip um, these spoon bills this was actually about and this was beyond the blue hour actually and the it was about an hour after sunset, um, but the sky was still being, it was still quite red. 
you know, we had these sort of low level clouds reflecting the last vest vestiges of light, creating this wonderful lighted conditions. Weather conditions, fog is my favorite. This is a, um, especially fog that's low lying and allows, um, you know, higher elements to stick above and be more contrasted against the fog. This is a, um, uh, an eagle's nest in Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. This is uh, in a dead pine tree. Again, and I've been taking photos of this in similar conditions over many years um, and, and got a whole host of different types of images. And here, here's another one. Um, but fog does dilute color. So you have to bear that in mind. And you can see that the, the cattail and water where the fog is low lying is quite, um, um, the, the colors are muted. Uh, whereas the the tops of the of the cypress trees in beautiful orange are above the fog and really contrast with that sort of fog below. Again, this is another eagle nest in uh, the northern Everglades. Don't be put off by poor weather. You can have terrible conditions, and then all of a sudden, you'll have a beam of sunlight, and it can create magic. And this is uh, what happened on Florida Bay. These are um, black skimmers in Florida Bay. Um, or, you know, create rainbows and really contrasting difference. The sun came out during the storm, created a rainbow. And actually, at the end of the rainbow is a is a, a foraging flock of wading birds. So, so my kind of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This is a, one of the coolest animals I've ever uh, photographed, a pygmy sloth. It's actually not a great photo at all. Um, this is actually to show that the white background can be, you know, the skies can be a little problematic during poor conditions, but I don't have time to go into the, the details of getting this photo, but it's one of the rarest animals in the world, only found, there's only a, a few hundred of them on one island in off Panama, and um, just seeing it was, uh, you know, this is my harpy eagle. But under other conditions, these gloomy white, bright skies can be quite effective here i've got a um smooth build annie and you know i wanted to show the, you know the kind of ragamuffin kind of you know it's on this um this um very spiky um tree it kind of just gives us you know the the background and like dark clouds but bright kind of gives it that um um the the feel that i'm looking for Take advantage of colors whenever you possibly can, especially in wetlands to show how beautiful they are. Here we have yellow and kind of lilac that kind of complement one another. Um, this is um, Grand Prince Maddox Spring in Yellowstone National Park. And I, it's kind of an abstract shot, but the colors are wonderful. And we've got some, comp we've got both complementary colors, the blues and the oranges, but we've also got some reds and purples that, that don't that are contrast with one another and provide a sort of unsettling feel to the scene and that's great we have it's a you know these colors are produced by um thermophilic bacteria um because this you know it's it's hundreds of you know the temperature of the water is hundreds of degrees and different bacteria in in different components or uh, different depths of 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 water depending on how hot it is um, but it kind of, it's beautiful, but there's a, somewhat of a sense of uneasiness about it. Finally, know your subject. Um, one, knowing your subject makes it much easier to find and photograph your image. And two, by knowing your subject, knowing their behaviors, that is what is going to enable you to figure out what is going to be an interesting behavior to go out and try to capture. And so, you know, the, capturing the essence of these animals is everything is a, a lim limkin doing what it does with an apple, you know, eating apple snails, um, a reddish egret, you know, very active, um, feeds in the shallows of, of, of bay, you know, um, estuaries and, and the coast, a uh, very active forager, dances as it's foraging. Wood storks are our thieves of the of the wading bird world. They will steal anything, believe me. 
if any bird catches a fish near them, they, they'll go for it. They won't bother with their own. And here, you know, two two nesting pairs are just squabbling over uh, and one group stealing the stick off another group. Animals are far more intelligent than we get to give them credit for. They have a lot more emotions. They the hormones, every the the nervous systems are built just like ours. They're not exactly the same, but we underestimate how intelligent and how uh, sentient they are. This is an image. I try to get images showing that connection between the animals, trying to show that sentience as much as I can. Juxtaposition of unsuspecting elements, and we're almost done here. Um, you know, just having a spider and a fish together. This is a six-spotted fishing spider hunting a hunting a, a gambusia, a mosquito fish. Um, but it's kind of a little shocking because you're not expecting to see a spider and a fish normally. So there's a interesting juxtaposition there. Um, finish off with ethical photography. Just you know, I, this is a sleeping sandhill crane on its nest. I used a blind for this. Do not disturb animals. Give them the respect. The photograph is not worth it if you're going to in any way disturb or harm the animal. We're trying to show the beauty of these animals. Their behavior is going to be much more natural if they're behaving naturally. So, you know, ethics is, is key. So in summary, define the story you want to tell. Keep it as simple as possible. Here we have a, an image just of a, 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 a split shot underwater with a nurse shark under a, or a lighthouse tower in the Keys. Um, think about your perspective, whether you want above eye level um, and move, move a lot and take different photos. Um, use the rule of thirds, but beware it doesn't always work. Use your gut. If it's not working, try to figure out why. But I would suggest that if you are a beginner, just use the rule of third thirds to start with. Use just some of these techniques and practice them. And then eventually it will become second nature to you. You'll fig, you know, use one of them at a the time, rule of thirds, um, color combinations, um, you know, the various things I'm telling. Try just to practice one at a time. And, and I think that will that's the way to do it. And once you've sort of mastered it and figured it out then it's kind of second nature, it's it's muscle memory. And then you move on to the next component of photography. And, and eventually everything would just come second nature. Take advantage of beautiful light and interesting weather. Understand your subject is so key. Um, you know, being able to understand the behaviors is key. And that and this is something every everybody can do. It's not this is not limited to a scientist. It helps. But there's a lot of information out there about all these animals and um, a little research goes a long way. And finally, consider um, the well-being of the animal. And with that, I'll end. I apologize that went on a little longer than I anticipated. And with that, I'll take any questions. Mm -hmm. Mark, thank you. That was that was wonderful. You definitely know your subject. and. Uh... I'm so jealous of, of the places you can go. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm reading up a Dr. Seuss book, but anyway, it is, you, you have, you have your, your ability to go to some of these places and see things from the air. It's just amazing. And a lot of people commented on that. So let me get started. Uh, Catherine Wiest uh, gave you a, a, a applause and big smiley face. Uh, uh, Paul Speck wants to know where to go by air, what areas? Um, in what respect? So, um, so I wonder what, so, so the areas I go to are the Everglades. Um, right. so if you want to rent a plane or something or a helicopter, then yeah, it's, it's phenomenal, but that, that's where I go. Um, drones are a little bit more difficult. So if you wanted to get, take some aerial photography with, with drones, there are, you know, there are a number of places Coast, but you do have to be careful of you know the rules and regulations and many areas uh will not allow you to use drones but 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 drone photography is is great too uh, uh cherry patillo wants to know which lenses do you prefer uh and how close uh, uh do you let the helicopter approach the birds 
So yeah, we're quite we're quite a way up. Um, and believe it or not, I don't know whether it's just because we've been using helicopters to monitor these birds for, you know, 30 or me 20 odd years and others longer. Um, they they don't mind the helicopter, actually. And particularly when there's a lot of food. The more food there is, the less they care. Um but what we typically do is we're flying at least five or 600, at the very minimum, five, 600 feet. Usually we're, and particularly over colonies, which is usually about 800 feet. So we're really high up. And the lenses I use, this is why we can't, I, you know, we're, drones will be difficult unless you're really low. Um, I'm using a telephoto, a one, a one to 500 millimeter telephoto lens to, to capture most of these. So yeah, so the... And which is great because it gives you a lot of flexibility on when when you're flying around and trying to take a photo of something interesting, I'm not moving myself. My pilots, who are actually very good at it, are moving for me. So I, I'm, you know, there's only a certain level of control. And I'm shooting through a window that's this size. So I don't have much up and down or side movement. So I'm very limited. So being able to zoom in and out and and compose that way is very important. Although the helicopter, when I want to do a vertical, more of a vertical shot, that what the helicopter pilot will do is because I can't shoot down because of the lens and the small window, they actually fly sideways <laughs> in very tight, fast circles. And it's um, it's quite gut-wrenching. Um, um, it, it, you need a very strong stomach to be able to take some of these photos. And fortunately I've developed that over the years. So not for the faint of heart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, well, faint of stomach, at least. Faint of stomach. <laughs> uh, Sandy Smolka wants, uh, says, I would love to see all the spoonies. Maybe Mark will take us along for the ride again. Be worse, uh, uh, Sandy, but have a strong stomach. Uh, uh, Carrie Freeman says these photos are amazing. Penny Prey. There are lots of nesting rosettes at uh, the Orlando Wetlands in, in Christmas, Florida. Orlando Wetlands was the very first manufactured reclamation wetlands in Florida when it opened in 1986. Carol White says, what photo, that photo with dolphins is incredible. I totally agree. Uh, Terry Patillo asks, would flamingos dine on the purple sulfur bacteria? Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, possibly. Possibly. I, I, I don't know. Maybe there's, you know, within those purple sulfur bacteria live within a uh, relative toxic environment, though. But, you know, other flamingo species, you know, they feed in these caustic soda lakes in Africa and and in Chile and places like that. So it's possible. I have... You know, seeing that purple sulfur bacteria is pretty rare. You don't get to see that, you know, every year. Um, but you know, it's it's possible. That's 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 interesting. That's fascinating. Uh, Carrie Freeman, and I'm not sure exactly uh, if she was responding to a specific image. Uh, that's why I've been a vegan for 25 plus years. We need more wildlife and habitat and fewer captive domestic animals and ag land used for feed crops and grazing. Uh, Priti Prate Desai uh, says, any plans for a book of your work, Mark? <laughs> plans, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, the, the, I do have plans for a book of the aerial ecology of the Everglades. It'll be kind of a photographic book with, but shows the ecology, a lot of these photos, basically, and with, with a write-up about the ecology, how it relates to the ecology. So, yes. Well, that's something we can all look forward to. I know yes. I, I will. Uh, Brandon Gull, G-U-E-L-L, -E I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Get to, uh, got to go now, but great presentation, science and photography, Mark. Thanks for being a champion for wildlife and wild places, particularly here in South Florida. Your scientific and conservation photography is in inspiring and empowering. I think it's meant inspiring and empowering. Keep up the good work. I couldn't agree more. Carol White says, my phone is out of juice, so unfortunately I have to leave. Excellent discussion. Thank you. I hope to get to Green K over the weekend. Uh, Lorraine Markcraft, Markcraft, great images. Pine glades at sunset can't be beat. And I know you're, you're there often, both morning yeah. probably and at sunset. Uh, Hilary Panair says, thank you for the amazing and inspiring presentation. Joanna Crilly, 
thanks, uh, many thanks for a super presentation, Cherry Patillo. We're, question, were the tiny feathers on the flamingo eye actually the beginning of the eye ring? Beginning of the what, sorry, Scott? Of the, of the eye ring. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's funny. You know, I noticed those little feathers too. They're fa I, I hadn't noticed, you know, without a photo, you wouldn't even notice those. Um, right, right. You know, I've looked at many flamingos before, quite close up, but I've never noticed those little feathers before. And so, um, but yeah, um, I, I, I don't know what that, if they have any adaptive value, but, um, or, you know. Right. And it's, it's funny, Mark, but I agree. It's only through the photos sometimes, because even through binoculars, you see it, but you're not really spending time looking at the, at something like the eyes. But in the right. photograph, because it's the person you're attracted to, you see those feathers. So yeah, yeah that's, that's so true. Uh, uh, Sandy Smoker, thanks, Mark. Love your photos and presentations. Spoonies, flamingos, avocets, keep up the great work. If you need an assistant, call me. <laughs> you're the best. I think she wants to go on those helicopter flights. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, Sandy. <laughs> uh, uh, Penny Prey, this photo is from Bush Wildlife Sanctuary. I'm not sure which one she's referring to in Jupiter Farms and published in Jupiter Magazine. Uh, so it must be one of the ones that you showed. Uh, Carol Wasowski, super photography, Mark, thank you. Shelly Rosenberg, thank you, Mark, for inspiring us all with your dedication to science and conservation and for sharing your journey as seen through your eyes with your stunning photography. So agreed. Uh, Sherry Patillo again, are you a member of the International League of Conservation Photographers? Perhaps your images could get more coverage and exposure, even inspiring some of the current ICLP photographers. I, I'm not. I wouldn't mind being there. Yes. Maybe, okay. maybe, maybe soon. <laughs> okay. Penny Prey, thank you, Scott and Mark. This was, a, it wasn't me who did this great presentation. This was a great presentation. Too bad we all cannot take to the air, but some really dramatic shots, but seeing these makes up for that uh, smiley face. Uh, Mark, uh, Diane J, thank you, Mark, for your brilliant presentation, dedication to using photography to capture the beauty of the Everglades and how climate affects our environment. Totally agree. Carrie Freeman again, Mark uh, Mark Beckoff's updated book on the emotional lives of animal is coming out on J Jane Goodall's birthday this month, April 9th. Oh, that's... Sounds good. Yep. Uh, uh, Lillian uh, Maniscalco, Maniscalco, amazing photos and great info. Thank you, Lauren Butcher. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your magnificent breathtaking images and for giving us a glimpse into your creative process. Fascinating, inspiring presentation. Sandra v Vargas, thank you. Terry Patillo, Mark has the brain of a scientist and the heart of an artist. I'm sure you love hearing that. His <laughs> patterns and creative artistry are exceptional. His work reminds me of Art Wolf, but he has added more habitat in the images. That's quite a compliment. That is. Thank you. <laughs> Monica Weller, uh, thank you. That was incredibly beautiful and informative. Really enjoyed the presentation and your photos. Uh, Ken Boyd, great. Uh, Mark, great presentation. I've been many times, I've seen many uh, things but learn something every every new every time. Regarding your technical talk, you can you can do many things you mentioned in the workshop. How often, if any, do you use uh, photo Photoshop uh, TP to uh, to create these image these image enhancements? I don't use Photoshop at all. Wow. Uh, I I use Lightroom. Okay, so you so you do, uh, do some post processing. Oh, absolutely. I okay. so. I would advise everybody to shoot in raw, raw format that pro produces a very dull original raw file. Um, but it captures so much more information than a JPEG and, and enables you to recreate what you've seen at a much higher quality. Um, remember, when you are when you create a JPEG, what you're doing, I could take a JPEG image, but what you're doing is you're allowing the computer, it, a JPEG is not necessarily a true representation. Instead of you doing the creative process, you're allowing the computer in your camera to do it for you. So it's setting the color settings, it's setting the contrast um, based on what it thinks is best based, you know, based on a computer program. And so um, not only does it not provide as a good a quality image, 
but it it doesn't give you the flexibility that you need to to really recreate uh you know what you're seeing in the field yes uh cynthia uh condor says thank you incredible presentation very interesting and informative and finally heather nash i'm so inspired by your photography Thank you so much for this, so much, <laughs> old, old cap letters, uh, for this phenomenal presentation, Mark. So that's it. Mark, thank Wonderful. you. Another brilliant presentation. I, I'm sure we'll have you back soon. I think you, it's a, I'm, I'm not sure whether you or Dr. Paul Gray has presented more for us, but you're you're both you're both up there neck and neck <laughs> for, for who yeah. has presented the most for Auto and Ever Guys. And we love you both. Thank you, Mark. That was that was wonderful. And I look forward to, to seeing you sometime on some of the walks that, that you lead. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for the wonderful compliments. I apologize again for the, the technical issues that kind of we were really struggling there. And uh, it kind of threw me off my game at the beginning. But uh, hopefully we, we we got there in the end. So, yes. But yes. Thank you. And, and, I, and I, I couldn't have been more grateful that it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, finally, uh, let me share my screen real, real quickly. If Mark, you could stop sharing yours. Yeah, I'm going to try. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. Stop sharing. And I just want to uh, give a big thank you to our great team, Ameline Cook, uh, Mark uh, Slifkin, who really saved me tonight. Uh, Autumn Coyote, uh, Natasha Warwick, who is somewhere in the field wrestling bats, uh, Mary Young, my my wife, uh, Sharish Cook, and Sabina Begg, who leads our programs team that help bring you these incredible virtual pr presentations. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next month uh, for our May presentation and our wonderful speaker uh, who's going to be present. I'll show it to you, who's going to be presenting on light pollution and terrestrial wildlife research into practice. That should be a wonderful presentation. And I think we could, well, there'll all be a lot to learn, particularly on what we can do to um, uh, help reduce the light pollution that's affecting wildlife. Have a great night, everybody. See you next month. Bye. <laughs>